Good afternoon. I'm Kate Seeley, Senior Vice President here at the Middle East Institute, and I want to welcome you to today's event celebrating the publication of two remarkable books, Art of the Emirates II and Portrait of a Nation II Beyond Narratives. These books were commissioned by the Abu Dhabi Music and Arts Foundation, ADMA, to mark the UAE's 50th anniversary and to capture at this key point in time, the remarkable transformation of the UAE's art scene from local to global. Both books and the ones that came before them, Art of the Emirates I and Portrait of a Nation I, represent an invaluable archive of the artists and the art producers and influencers uh, who have contributed to such a rapid growth of the UAE art scene. And they serve as really invaluable um, archives uh, for researchers um, going forward. I want to thank Adma for selecting MEI as the venue uh, for the launch of these two books. Uh, Adma was founded in 1996 by Her Excellency Huda Al Khamis Kanu uh, to nurture the arts uh, and to educate around the arts and to promote creativity in the UAE and abroad. And they put on an annual uh, cultural festival, the Abu Dhabi Festival, as well as uh, events throughout the year uh, and, and really are one of the key uh, stakeholders uh, in the art scene uh, of the UAE. Uh, they understand so deeply the importance and value of, of bridging uh, cultures through the arts. And we've been very fortunate to share a vision uh, with them of bringing more Middle Eastern arts and culture to uh, Washington. Uh, and together we've organized uh, several events, including uh, a festival of Arabic literature in the spring. This fall, we're hosting the world-renowned Syrian clarinetist uh, and his quartet, Kinan Azme, for a performance at uh, Wolf Trap, at the Barnes Wolf Trap. And we're also hosting an exhibition of art on um, climate change and sustainability with Maya El Khalil, uh, who's also the curator of a Portrait of a Nation to Beyond Narratives. So stay tuned for those events. As for the books, they are on sale. Uh, you can purchase them after the event. Uh, and I, I encourage you to, to walk away with, with one or two of them. Now here to talk about the books, uh, the development of the UAE art scene and the critical role of artists uh, in this incredible transformation are Melissa Grunland and Ibtisam Abdelaziz. Uh, Melissa is the editor of the Art of the Emirates II book um, and managing editor of the Portrait of a Nation II book. She's based in London. She writes on contemporary art, culture and uh, cultural politics of the Middle East for the Times, for the Guardian, for the New Yorker. She also uh, works a lot for the National and was a longtime resident of the UAE uh, and is also author of the book Contemporary Art and Digital Culture. Uh, Ibtisam Abdelaziz is a contemporary uh, multidisciplinary Emirati artist and writer who explores issues of identity and culture through installation, performance, painting, and works on paper. She is a pioneering Emirati artist, one of the first contemporary artists and first contemporary women artists working uh, in the UAE. She's a former mathematician and she brings the concepts of geometry uh, and, and math into the works that explore um, issues of identity and belonging. And her work has been in major exhibitions, uh, both in the UAE and internationally, but just to know here, she was uh, in the UAE's very first Venice Biennale show in 2009, representing uh, the UAE. So a big thanks to both of you for joining us today. Um, we couldn't be, I couldn't be with two people who know more about the art scene than you two. It's really a delight to be here to talk about something so dear to, um, to all of us. And Melissa, I want to start with you as the editor of Art of the Emirates One, um, which I should note is an incredible uh, compilation of essays with key stakeholders in the art world, gallerists, um, museum heads, uh, collectors, art educators, and it, and it divides, the book is divided into different sort of segments, the history, the, the art market, um, the institutions, and, and, and it tracks from like 2016 onwards, correct? Mm -hmm. So it's quite um, a, a compendium. And I want you to talk about what, what is the story that this compilation of voices tells us about sort of the transforming art scene from 2016 to today? And, and who are some of the major kind of players and, and, and some of the institutions in this art ecosystem that are critical to this growth? Uh, well, first of all, let me say thank you for having us on behalf of myself, who loves your program, and ADMAF. Um, and also the book was done by me, but also with Roxanne Zand, who was a co-editor, 
Maya al Khalil, who was the curator of Portrait of a Nation Two, which is the exhibition that Portrait of a Nation is a catalog for. Um, and while Marcos, who's an amazing Lebanese designer based in Brooklyn. So I just wanted to make sure everyone, <laughs> everyone is properly credited. Yes, thank um, you. The word that people often use for the UAE art scene is transformation. And I think, you know, I think it's entirely accurate because the UAE presents this amazing test case of a situation where you had a small but established art scene, you had um, artists working, you had poets, you had filmmakers, you had a cultural scene, but then at a certain point, you know, which is kind of the late 2000s, visual arts becomes a priority for the leadership, for um, important stakeholders in Sharjah and Abu Dhabi and in Dubai. And the, the, everyone kind of gets behind art as this means of cultural transmission and, and, and kind of even over and above poetry, over and above filmmaking, it's art that everyone wants to um, be making, be showing and be showing abroad. So it becomes transformative in this way, where, you know, what happens when you have a scene and you have a state with a lot of resources mm. and suddenly you turbocharge it, you know, what happens to the art that's made? What's happened to the artist? What happens, um, you know, how, how do you build an infrastructure that has immense ambitions in a very short time period? So that that is really the, the story of this book. And, you know, it started in 2016, it kind of goes before, before that and the portrait of a nation also, um, despite the fact that there was an earlier portrait of, the nation, of a nation, it also goes back into history because what we keep on finding the people who are working in the UAE is that there's this real um, uh, kind of epidemic of forgetting. You know, it's very difficult to remember when it's a very transient population and also when there are no institutions of memory. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you think in 2016, that was before the Louvre Abu Dhabi opened, it was before you had um, MFA programs, it was before you had the Al Sarkal Foundation, you really just had Sharjah, which was um, kind of following its own path and having an incredible museums landscape and incredible contemporary art scene, but kind of removed from the rest of the nation. So if you don't have public spaces to show FD Sam's work, for example, or if you don't have art history programs where you can teach uh, young artists about Hassan Sharif or Muhammad Qasim or all the people that who are recognized as pioneers, you kept on having to re-perform this memory. Mm. You had to remind people that they weren't the first artists in the UAE, that there were other people working. And, and this kind of dishwasher mentality or this washing machine mentality where you, people kept on, um, you know, kept on free, forgetting what had happened five years ago was something that around 2016, 2017, the, the time that this book looks at really addresses. So this book is kind of um, like it's an act of memory. It's right, not just right. it's not just what happened, but it's kind of trying to seize that moment in which people turn around and they say, "Wait, why are we always looking forward? Why what happened before? What happened back then? And how can we build on it?" And that right. and that as much as building Louvre Abu Dhabi is a key shift in in the art scene. Right? And you talk to such a you know a, a wide array of people who were involved in the moment before 2016 and after, from mm -hmm. gallerists to collectors, and talk about some of those sort of stakeholders and the role they play in you know helping turbocharge or, or, or contributing to this turbocharged sort of scene. Well, I have to say that I got very lucky with this book. <laughs> because um, we did this book during COVID, but I hit, I hit everyone at the exact moment when people were comfortable with Zoom, like they knew how to use Zoom, but they weren't bored of it yet. So, and they also had nothing to do because everyone was <laughs> stuck at home. So I, I was able to like call up the director of Louvre Abu Dhabi and be like, can you be on a panel next Wednesday? He was like, yeah, yeah, sure. So I had this access because everybody was just, sitting around and they were also very candid. There was, a, it was a real feeling of openness also because I think at that moment of COVID, mm. there was a real fear for the art world scene. Like what's gonna happen next and, and how are we gonna get through this? So everyone kind of wanted to come together. So right. it, it actually allowed for these um, conversations to unfold that were are really about um, solidarity and about, um, you know, I think if, if all of you have come, I think you must know the UAE a little bit, but the three main emirates involved in the art scene have been Sharjah, which has been under the direction of, of Sheikh Sultan, who is an extraordinary intellectual, an extraordinary thinker, an extraordinary mm -hmm. man. And he set up way before anyone else did um, a series of museums and the Sharjah Biennial, which is, is taken over by his daughter, Sheikh Hafor, 
who then brought it to you know international heights. Um, then you had Dubai that had Art Dubai and kind of more market-based commercial art scene. And then Abu Dhabi, which has kind of come laterally with more heft and, and mm. more museums. Um, and, and there was always a kind of you know, very quiet competition among the three Emirates to say like who got there first or who was doing more. But actually in this moment, this post COVID moment and this kind of moment of maturity for the art scene, you see actually Abu Dhabi being like, oh, you got, you know, Dubai, you can do market, we're the museums. And Sharjah being like, right. we're the, you know, we're the biennial and, and, and you know, more local museums. So it was actually this kind of very calm point when people um, were very generous with their thoughts. Uh, I don't right. know, did that answer your question? I'm not sure. <laughs> well, and what's interesting in terms of the, the three Emirates is that they've ended up really complementing each exactly. other because they each address different sort of sectors yeah. of the art scene. One, the market, one, the sort of, you know, global museum destination, one, the sort of, you know, bottom up, you know, art biennale. But, you know, I have so many questions, but, but maybe for the audience, um, maybe you could spell out, you touched upon it, this question of how did the UAE go from local to global, mm. you know, in, I don't know, 15 to 20 years, like, what were those key turning points? What, how did we get here to a place where, you know, we're talking about the UAE's art scene, and we have all these wonderful books that have finally been published, and, you know, it's recognized in New York and elsewhere. How did we get here? Um, I mean, I guess the, the very boring, accurate answer is there are many factors. Yeah. But the short answer is, um, I mean, you had a situation of regional instability. So Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, a lot of people had to leave, um, you know, leave the traditional art centers and then move to Abu Dhabi, move to Dubai, move to Sharjah. And they kind of brought their um, nous and their, you know, energy and enthusiasm to the UAE. You know, when, you know, the UAE was very welcoming and opening towards other demographics. So, you had kind of this incredible moment of many different cultures, many different people mixing and sharing ideas, which can, which can only be good. Um, but there was also a concerted, you know, effort by the leadership. You know, 2008, 2007, 2008, Abu Dhabi announces its Sariat Museums project, where they say they're going to build four world-class museums on Sariat Island, which at that point was just sand. You know, so there was a real, that, that sense of ambition and, and the promise of ambition right. that, you know, it, that if people were to pitch up with projects, there would be financial backing and, and there would be, you know, interest among the populace. So I think that, um, you know, th that kind of knowledge of the leadership was behind it. But then, you know, Art Dubai came, Art Dubai was started in 2007, I think, or 2000, no, 2003. And I think, again, because of this regional instability, Art Dubai became the crossroads place where everyone discussed ideas on the beach. Mm -hmm. and, and there was that also that just Dubai sense of anything can happen if we build it, they will come that, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of, it was that moment, that magical moment. So I think, um, you know, a lot of things contributed to a sense of energy and a sense of possibility that, you know, it's kind of hard to say that one thing was the turning point. Right. Um, and, and I really believe it was kind of, as nebulous as it sounds, it was the energy of the time. Right. And, and then, then the you know wherewithal to turn that energy into bricks and mortar possibilities, such as the Etihad Museum or Louvre Abu Dhabi and forthcoming. Right. Google the commitment to invest the resources and to make the fine arts a priority more exactly. so than like cinema or theater. Well, this is a good point to like bring you in, Ebtisam, because you have witnessed this, this transformation. You've been part of it. You've been involved in making the transformation happen. Um, the book that Melissa was talking about, Art of the Emirates 2, looks at 2016 forward and talks about these incredible institutions and resources like you know, the new like NYU Abu Dhabi and you know, these, especially like the educational institutions, none of which existed. So during your time. So could yeah. you talk a little bit like about what the ecosystem was like when you started in the 2000s as an artist and, and how you sort of made it, how you emerged as an artist in these conditions? Yeah, uh, first of all, can everybody hear me? Okay, good. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, good to see you, Melissa and uh, Kate. Uh, thanks Middle East Institute and thanks to um, ADMATH. Um, um, so back to your question, I, to be honest, when I read the book, I was like, wow, 
they're very lucky yes. reading all of that and i'm like oh my god i remember my time when there were nothing basically we were just artists and we wanted to make things we just want to be here we just want to express our art we just want to build this uh, community we wanted to feel safe uh, we wanted to be here so uh, i for example read reading about the art schools now like mm, i wish i could go back and get a degree in the art but i don't regret it because then I have some sort of different element in my art that I'm using, which is the math and the systems. Um, but then it will be nice when I graduate from high school to go have more than one option, which is math, because I love math. But then I wish that I would get the education right. that these young, amazing, talented art these days are getting. Uh, so there is nothing there. Uh, zero education. Right. Um, I um, had to convince my parents that I want to become an artist. And of course, as a dad, like, artist, what is art? What are you going to be doing? We need you to find a job. So right. you need to get a degree. So it's that, you know. Right. So they, how did you make that leap well, from I am, math to I art? I think um, I got my degree, was happy, came back from Alain. Uh, I was living in Sharjah at that time. So I was like, dad, here, this is my degree. <laughs> you can frame it, just take me to the Emirates Fine Art Society. I heard about this place and they're teaching art. Mm -hmm. uh, and I want to learn how to draw. And he's like, you already know, we, I framed your paintings. And I'm like, no, I want to be an artist. So it was like hard, but he, my dad is, <laughs> He was supposed to be an artist, so I will give him some credit. Uh, he did have an amazing talent. He can draw, he can do calligraphy. He, we're talking about 1975. He had an amazing collection of big cameras and lenses. So mm. this guy, he knows what he was doing. Unfortunately, he had six kids to feed. So uh, he didn't get the education, but he was kind of understanding me because that's where he come from. So he was very supportive. He drove me to the Emirates Fine Arts Society. I happened to be there at the right time when Hassan Sharif and Muhammad Kadam were giving um, summer workshops mm -hmm. uh, at the Emirates Fine Arts Society. And these are some of the most famous contemporary yeah. artists in the UAE. Yeah, yeah, so that's how it started. So I happened to be at the right time with the right people at the right place. Um, mm -hmm. And then I start learning how to draw, still life, basic stuff. But then Hassan Sharif was there and he believed that uh, art is not just the scales that you're gonna learn. You can't just draw and, you know, and be an artist. You have to have that um, lecture, that mindset of what is art. So he kept lecturing us about uh, the history of the art, um, who are the conceptual artists. And so I think that was, uh, that was the most important um, thing that happened to me as an artist. It, it shaped my way of thinking. It opened my eyes to what is art. Um, and then in terms of spaces, there were none. There were, there were like zero spaces, in, at least in my city. There was the Sharjah Art Museum, but you can't really get in it. You, you have to, and that is, I'm gonna talk some politics here, forgive me. <laughs> it's like you have to be somebody and you have to get the support from somebody financially to be in the museum. So you have to get an invitation from this country or mm -hmm. somewhere. So it was like more politics. It was not really about art. So if you have money, if you have uh, an embassy that will support you, then you can get to the museum. So there was nothing there. Um, to make it short, but there was like the strong art community. We were like, the, like a fan, the five yes. artists: yes. Hassan, Muhammad Kadam, um, Hussein Sharif, Muhammad Ahmed Ibrahim, and Abdullah Sadi. And there was this bad girl <laughs> who was hanging around the boys. That was me. Yeah. So <laughs> that was like that was like me. Oh, she's the girl. She's around the boys. She's you know the fighter. She's the troublemaker. Nice. 
And and that is me, unfortunately. I mean, that was That's me. That's why you're such a great artist. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the beginning. It was like, oh, how come she is around the boys and right. she's doing this and that? So that is the space. We go to right. Hassan Sharif's house. We read. We write. I turned to become an artist because people did not get this art right. that we're making. So I had to educate them instead of fighting them so that is yeah how to you give you started. an idea of what, what was right. it at right. that time can I, yes can please I add two things two things to two points one on that normalization you know you're, you're talking about turning points like the when you think of the the royal women who publicly um, espoused art you had Sheikh Ahur who's the daughter of Sheikh Sultan in Sharjah the Sheikh Latifa who founded Tashkil which is a, a network of studios and exhibition site in Dubai and Sheikh Latifa, who is now head of Dubai culture. So you had these three really strong, and um, the Sheikh Salama Foundation yes. in Abu Dhabi. So you had these four incredibly strong and, and you know, very high up royal women and women like Huda Kanu, Her Excellency Huda Kanu, who kind of stuck their necks out and said, I, you know, we support art. And I think that normalized it for, for so many young women, especially who wanted to become artists, you know, in, in that kind of, negotiation right. with their family. I think you, can, you can't underestimate the fact that these people kind of stood up as standard bearers for the vocation of art yes. and, and kind of legitimized it at a very early stage. Right. So you had, that's what I mean, like you have a lot of luck in the, these turning points. Um, but the other thing I will say, it's only because I'm an, an inveterate teacher, is um, this is, so Maya El Khalil is the person who did Portrait of a Nation. I'm jumping ahead of your very organized plan for the talk. Um, but what was great about Maya's uh, exhibition was that she did so much research into the early days of the UAE art scene, and, and which sounds like something that shouldn't be that exciting, but in this dishwasher mentality that I was talking about before, actually, there's a lot of work that's still to be done, that still needs to be done. And she's unearthed this um, painting from 1978 by Ahmed Al-Ansari. And this is this um, uh, painting of a beggar that he passed around to different um, people in Sharjah and in Dubai to try and raise money for the founding of the Emirate, Emirates Art, oh, wow. uh, Fine Art Society. Wow. So that's how they, you know, it was a really collective, um, collective enterprise, but Sheikh Sultan gave this um, kind of courtyard building in this kind of heritage area near to the Sharjah Art Museum in Sharjah to this group of artists who were really like, really far out there, you know, in terms of, Nobody was behind them. <laughs> Nobody thought they were doing great things. He was always getting into fights with everybody, Hassan Sharif. I mean, you know, you knew him, I didn't, but, but from what I understand. But he, you know, Sheikh Sultan kind of gave them the space um, to do it quite physically and, and, and metaphorically. So that Emirates Fine Art Society that Eftisam was talking about, like that, that's really the heart. Yes, it's a of foundational where institution. But how did you take that experience, you know, there at the Emirates Art Society and, 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 and turn it into a kind of a commercial venture? In other words, who were the, how did you emerge as a commercial artist? Who were the platforms that supported you and put you out there for sale and got you into shows, Eftisam? Well, to make it short, and that is my experience, uh, we're talking about 2000. 2000 and I start making, teaching, writing, trying to exhibit, uh, trying to be accepted, knowing that I'm doing, you know, geometric art and math and stuff that not everybody get performance and stuff. But it's funny, um, when Sheikh Ahur came back and she decided to change the image of what is the Sharjah Biennial uh, in 2003, she decided to make it more like an art critical platform instead of countries, embassies, inviting artists to exhibit anything and everything. So she was being very selective. So I think that draw some attention to the, the six of us, the five boys mm. with Ibtisam doing the stuff that she was bringing from all over the world. And that was like a, a turning point to, to all of us because mm then everybody who internationally <laughs> heard about the Sharjah Biennial, most of art lovers, collectors, and creators from all over the world came to visit to see this thing called the Sharjah New Sharjah Biennial. So they met us. And then the year later, I was already in 
the Bourne Museum. I was in um, Stuttgart. I was wow. in the first Singapore biennial. So I think that was for me, for me internationally started before the local thing. So I yes. was already in 2005 and big biennials all over the world in the museums. And then the art, the art fair happened. And then I got to meet the third line uh, and then they liked my art. So they were, to be honest, um, they were helping me in terms of uh, being work on my business uh, or being on the art market mm -hmm. uh, where I was already there intellectually as an artist, well known, but in the art market third line paid play like a very important role in me being there in the art market and then Dubai Art Fair and then the Abu Dhabi Art Fair. Um, right, so, that, so, the, so the sort of ecosystem caught up with you and sort of developed and found right. you and then, yeah. you know, gave you those platforms. And of course, uh, the third line is at El Sarkal Avenue, which is host to many, many key galleries mm -hmm. um, in the UAE in Dubai and has played a key role in sort of, you know, uh, providing a platform for a lot of creativity. Yeah. Um, but that's that's a wonderful story, and we're going to talk more about your art um, in a bit. But let's maybe let's since we're we're on this well we're now on Iftisam's image, okay. but I want to go back to the book that we're about to introduce. And thank you for introducing it, Melissa. Uh, Portrait of a Nation Two. It is the catalog for a tremendous show that opened uh, at Manarat Al Sadiyat in Abu Dhabi last January um, and ran through the the spring. And you can find it online. Uh, of course, it was put on by Adma to mark the 50th anniversary, and is curated by a remarkable curator, Mayal Khalil, who we'll be working with. We're so honored. She's really a, a very intellectual curator who's, who, who, as Melissa said, did huge research into the art of UA to an extent that nobody had before. And so this, this show with more than 60 artists and more than 110 works really represents something almost as comprehensive as one has ever had um, in terms of a survey of UAE art. And of course, uh, you know, you've seen it, you've seen it many times, I'm sure, maybe you've written about it, and maybe you can talk, Melissa, a little bit about the show, what's so significant about it, what your impressions of it were, and yeah, why it's unique. Yeah, I mean, you know, Maya is a really extraordinary curator, and she is Lebanese, but she was based in Saudi for many years, and she didn't know the UAE art scene. Um, so when she came to the UAE, she kind of came as like an outsider insider, someone who maybe understood the context, but had to discover what had happened. And I think that was a real boon because, um, you know, there's kind of an established narrative about what's happened in the UAE, which is that there was this, the five and empty sum. <laughs> and Hassan, you know, Hassan Sharif was kind of the focal point and, and everything revolved around this one character. And there's a story where Hassan Sharif goes to um, buy the Bayam Shah School of Art in London, learns about conceptualism and fluxus and comes back and kind of you know, inculcates the, the UAE artists in conceptualism. And, and that's kind of been the, um, yeah, like the skeletal story that everybody mm. knows and everyone kind of rehearses. And, you know, when I was talking before about this dishwasher mentality, one, one of the key things from my, the book that, that I did, Art of the Emirates, was to look at this spate of shows in 2017 that suddenly turned around and looked back. Um, and one of them was by Sheikh Ahor. Another one was a, a retrospective of Hassan Sharif by Sheikh Ahor. One was by Muhammad Kazim um, uh, called, well, Muhammad Kazim and, and some other people called um, Is Old Gold, which deliberately or like questioned this, this gap between what happened and, and the knowledge in the present. Um, a show by Maya, um, Maya Allison and the um, Emirates Fine Arts Society show. And they all, these five shows appeared out of nowhere in 2017, suddenly looking backwards. And it, it made people realize that actually um, the story isn't well known. There was this one story about the five, but we have to go back and do the work to populate it, to say that, that there were many other things going on that we don't know about. And Maya basically came in and did that. You wow. know, she, she picked up the gauntlet, gauntlet that was thrown in 2017. And one of the things she did, and this has a sad, sad um, a state to even mention, but 
she could speak Arabic, you know, and so many people who come to the UAE and write on the UAE or um, academics who go to the UAE to write about the art scene still don't have Arabic. Mm -hmm. And that is just really problematic. Um, so she was able to, you know, do more oral history research to mm -hmm. speak to um, family members, to look in the archives of the Emirates Fine Art Society. And what she found is that, you know, it was much more cosmopolitan from the beginning. So mm -hmm. since the UA, since the Emirates Fine Art Society was established in 1979, there were Palestinians, there were Syrians, there were Sudanese, there were Indians. The, you know, it, it was a melting pot from the very beginning. I think what people seem to understand was you had Hassan Sharif and these artists around him were, who were all Emiratis. And then Art Dubai comes in the early 2000s and it's this global international um, shift you know, and that's true, it became global and international in that it became English speaking, and it became attached to this art world that was interested in the, the Sharjah Biennial and the international came to um, came to the UAE, but there was this different kind of international and Arabic international that was there from the very beginning and that's what um, Maya was able to bring out in this exhibition, and so she did, so she found, I, I have a selection here, so this is Abdul Latif al um, and the, this is a work from, I've, I've written down the dates so I wouldn't mess up, I wouldn't forget them. This is from the 1970s, I mean, what an incredible work. Wow. I mean, and there's, you know, this work is, hasn't been seen, has been in a private collection. Um, this is a work, he's still making work, Abdul Latif al Smoudi from 2000. Um, this is from 1984, Bashar Simwar, who was a Palestinian artist. And see here, what I like about this, it looks like it's just a um, kind of like a sweet scene, you know, like, um, you know, like a regular cityscape landscape in the Arab world, but you can see modernity coming in, you can see like the concrete mixer, you can see the telephone wires, so you have this really subtle juxtaposition of change, you know, this is UAE as it was, this is UAE as it's becoming. Right, and these are sort of these under discovered artists yeah. i mean the, the show is uh you know full of contemporary artists but also has some of these sort of earlier you know maybe modern um painters but but also what's interesting is that it's you know it's a show put on by admath marking the 50th anniversary and it's it is comprised of emirati artists and also many artists from syria from lebanon from palestine really sort of embracing this notion that mm you know, the UAE art scene is in a way a melting pot and that, yeah. you know, all of these nationalities have influenced each other and contributed to where we are today. Yeah, and that's exactly. what I thought found yeah, so interesting. Yeah, no, it's so true. I mean, so all these works, this is one from a Sudanese artist, were, were shown, but shown in the Emirates Fine Art Society and not shown in this like Louvre Abu Dhabi, al Sarkal Avenue, so, you know, international English speaking circulation. And so what this show does, is it really bridges these two together and I, you know, for, for people who have done the work and done the archives and know about these people or have heard about their, their work but never actually seen it. It was such a beautiful show to go back and look and see the all the work that was done that people didn't know about. Wow. Um, it was, yeah, I had a, the privilege of seeing it for about 20 minutes. It was gorgeous. And yeah. of course, Saatzi Sam's work there, you're one of the featured artists as a pioneer artist. And, you know, I'd love to, you know, talk about the work that they have um, that they selected it's one of your earlier works it's a video um, of a performance and i think we're going to watch the video um, and then talk this is one of the images that's included in the piece but uh this is a performance piece and i think it was quite a a radical piece for its time yeah. and maybe you can talk about it Ibtisam, and also the, the impact it had sure This is from 2012. No, this is in the heritage area of the sea. Oh, it's 
So this were the projects that I start collecting my um, ATM bank statements. Um, and the piece is called Autobiography. Obviously, from your bank statement, you see the location, the time, and the date of that day, and the amount of money you have in your bank. Um, and then I decide to print them out on this outfit, and I decide to perform. Um, the piece is really about uh, bringing us all together, and obviously we all are numbers. I live in America, and I have a social security number, so we all are just numbers. Uh, the numbers here are more about um, us uh, become really like into consuming instead of giving and contributing knowing each other. Um, and it was not easy in 2007 to, for a female artist, to uh, perform performance artwork. I'm sick of saying the same story. <laughs> it was not easy. I, uh, I was yeah. being questioned. Uh, what are my intentions? Why am I using my body? Is it anti-Islamic thing, anti-culture? We're Arabs, we're Muslim. I am proud of all of that, but I'm not doing anything wrong. Um, and uh, obviously, you're in charge, and I had to stop by the police. They were questioning, almost arrested me, but they did not mm -hmm. because I think I was smart enough to have a letter from Sheikh Ahur, who happened <laughs> to run the biennial and the museum at that time, that I am an artist and I'm not doing anything wrong. Either help me or do nothing or don't right. stop her. But they helped me at the end. I went to this shopping mall in Sharjah, um, Mega Mall, and they helped me. The security was around me and, and I said, no, I don't want you to be around me. I want them to interact with me. Right. So he helped. Uh, they did understand the, the society, the people, the community were rejecting it because they don't know. They don't know that this is art. And I thought it, it is my role to explain that instead of, you know, fighting them. And so I start writing and I really wanted to not just, I could just perform in front of the museum in that art area in Sharjah, but I decided to go beyond that right. because and i that is my way to educate them instead of right because you, you must be the this is the first performance art sort yes. of piece in the uae done yes. by a woman or a man i mean i, I uh, know, yeah i don't i remember hassan it, sharif did some some did in the gold. the 70s but it was in the desert so really right. there no, were no up. audience and, and, and what was i mean what were you hoping to achieve with this you, you said you wanted to educate what what were you what was the dialogue you wanted to have well first of all i'm again it's the idea of having art and just galleries and mm. museums everybody should see art you should not be in just these areas, how, how am I going to educate my grandfather at that time if he doesn't go to the museum? Maybe he's actually, they were leaving the mosque and they saw this crazy woman performing. So he was like, what is this? So that is shocking to them, but believe me, it helped us to educate everybody. Um, so that is my intention. It's art is not just for uh, us artists and art educator. Um, the other thing is I, I really think I want to, I like to challenge people. I can't just do something safe. I'm not that person. Mm. So I want to uh, push the boundaries. I want women to be more open and I want us to be more accepted in the art because it's not just men. We were few women doing art at that time. So I thought, no, I would like to perform. Mm. And that is the only way for this piece, this concept to be presented in the way where your body is moving and you are the autobiography, you are the numbers and that's us, we're numbers. So the best way to do that is to perform. Right, amazing. Um, yeah. And so do you continue that. to do performance art yes. now? As a Yes, um, definitely. In DC, recently I did um, an um, art residency program in Montgomery College in uh, mm -hmm. Silver Spring, Tacoma, and I worked with students. I did performance wearing the the COVID, uh, you know, isolation suit, and okay. it has the word COVID all around. So there is like. A, um, style, I would call it, like there is like Iftisam and mm. so I'm still doing performance, yeah. Amazing. Well, yeah. maybe this is a good chance to kind of bring this all forward now since we are sort of 
running out of time and, yeah. and talk a little bit about the now and the future. And, you know, you were such a pioneering artist. Uh, you remain a pioneering artist. Of course, you did this all against the backdrop of very few resources and very little infrastructure. And I'm just wondering, you know, as you see all these artists, these young artists who have access to residencies and scholarships and galleries and platforms, um, do you see them taking the same risks and pushing the same boundaries that you did? Have they been following? I love them, but no, they're not. I, they're not. I, I, it's sad because I feel like I did something there, guys. So you need to right, build on continue. This. Yeah, I take yeah. it and move forward. I feel like they're still shy reading the book also. I, and to give them some credit, I haven't seen exhibition since the last two years because I was here isolated in the US, I couldn't go home. Yeah. But from online, seeing exhibition, reading, uh, we did a program called CAA Art Talk and stuff. And so I met some of the artists, Afra Dahiri, I met other. Um, so I know they're doing things, but there, there is still fear. They're not, uh, I don't know, maybe they're not confident, they're scared. Uh, I think I would like to maybe build a society where women can choose to be artists first and mm. then to be a mother second. Mm. I'm not a mother, so who am I to, to tell them what to do? But like, I, I had some girls talking to me, helping them with their art, and they were like, oh, this guy wants to marry me. Should I take it? But they don't know art. They don't understand art. They don't want me to be an artist. Mm, so still, right. there is something there. Um, I think what they're doing is amazing. I've seen so many um, female artists, and that's right. great. It's really great to see the number is, the number is increasing. Yeah. Uh, but I would like to them to see push them pushing more. harder. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, Melissa, you, 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 you've been there and reporting on this scene and, you know, you talk in the book about sort of the current state in which there's this movement toward art collectives, right, away mm -hmm. from kind of bottom down, top down investment in the arts and this more, more of a bottom up, you know, engagement with the arts. Maybe, you know, in, in looking at like the, where we are today and, and looking ahead. Talk about sort of these new trends that you see and the sort of impact you think you'll have. I mean, have. That, that is the million dollar question, isn't it? Um, and you know the honest answer is I don't know. I don't know what's coming next, and it's not not because I'm bad at my job, just because this is a real moment of change for the art scene. You know, I mean, not just internationally, the COVID, the economy, and you know, regionally, the rise of Saudi, what's happening in Lebanon, but you know, in terms of the actual artists on the ground, you know. So I did, I had organized the book into five sections and the last one, which Kate is referring to is called collectives and we had a, a kind of a roundtable discussion among all these young artists who have organized into collectives. And two of those since last year when we did it have already disbanded. Mm. One because they were given so many new opportunities, Afra al Dahari, who MT Sam referred to is one of them, you know, they kind of bound it together because there was very little infrastructure and they wanted to create a space where artists could speak to each other. Artists could exhibit, artists could have studios, but now because the Guggenheim is coming, because all these new opportunities are coming their mm -hmm. way, they want, to, they, they, they want to follow the opportunities and don't have time to do the collective. So, mm -hmm. you know, you can see actually how these, how the infrastructure is changing before our very eyes. Right. So, and also the second thing is one of the, the big changes has been art education. There were no, there were no programs in just art. You had to take um, design, you had to take architecture, you had to take media relations if you wanted to get close to art. Now they have art programs. So you've educated, and you know, all these young kids who have just taken, who've just graduated from these programs are now kind of out there in the world. And it's like giving your kids the keys to your car. <laughs> like, who knows? You know, I really right. would say, who knows what's going to happen because there are, are so many of them and um you know it's really it's really an ex really an exciting time right and, right um, it's unlikely that the next 15 years will be as sort of yeah rapidly transformational as the past 15 years but of course there'll be change and new opportunities 
But I'm wondering, looking ahead, where are some of the gaps? Like if some, we were talking about this earlier. Where are the gaps? Where would you like to see more development um, of the art infrastructure in the UAE? What's what's needed? Can I dream? Please, we're here okay. to dream. <laughs> so I think if I, if I were in charge, I think I'll start building um, art studio buildings where artists can be together, even if they don't want to collaborate. They have to be around each other. That's how we supported each other in my time in the early 20s, because that is the, the, the basic, that is the foundation. That's what's going to keep us going instead of, you know, just having program, having all opportunities. And Afra and her group, they wanted to be together because of that. And then when they found lots of opportunity, they got lost. So I think if we focus on the quality and less quantity, we don't mm -hmm. have to do so many exhibitions in, within a month all, all over the map, right? I think, I think if also we uh, make a good selection of what is, what is right and what's wrong, I think that will help to shape, you know, to shape the, the, the image of, of the UAE because I'm reading the book and I'm seeing things and I was like, oh, that's amazing. But I'm confused reading this book and hearing all of that and hearing the female artists wanting to be more free and wanted to do that and wanted to be maybe presented by a gallery. And that's the other thing, all of these institutions and galleries, they should work together. Uh, I personally uh, have work that is saleable, which is the geometric painting, systematic art, and I have work that no gallery want to take care of. So how do we encourage artists to be true to themselves where they can exhibit and um, reduce what is right for them instead of thinking, oh, this gallery is not going to buy this yeah. piece, right? Yeah. So yeah, it's an age old it's, yeah, <laughs> challenge. It's scary to have all yeah. of these opportunities. Well, this is just final thoughts before we open to the audience, you know, about the gap or the what's needed next. What would you like to see more of? I mean, I believe I, I agree with up to some. Like, is it possible to say fewer opportunities? <laughs> <laughs> wow. But, it, you know, they're just running to stand still, these artists. And Mm. you know it's a challenge it's a challenge when you have a young artist and you know in in dc or in new york or in london and berlin you're a young artist you have your first show at a place where like four people go to see and you did a terrible job you mess up you have a, a terrible artwork doesn't work out but only four people have seen it so you live and learn but when you have your first show at Louvre Abu Dhabi or you have your first show reviewed in a national newspaper you make your mistakes on a national stage and mm. that's really hard. So, um, yeah, like it, 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 it feels really weird to say. Right, like there almost is a back. more sort of like <laughs> organic low key space for people to yeah. develop. And, and and I think people yeah. know that, you know, Warehouse yeah. 421 is doing a great program in that, but um, yeah, but more room for failure. <laughs> yeah, okay, and I think more, more room for art criticism you were discussing earlier. Yeah. But, but let me open the floor up to questions from the audience. We're uh, running short on time and I'm mindful that everyone has to get back to their offices and homes and work. Their screen. <laughs> their screen, uh -huh. <laughs> their iPhone. Please just uh, say who you are now. Yeah, sorry, uh, my, I'm Crystal Lemire. I used to be an advisor to the Abu Dhabi government and thanks for a great um, discussion. I, mean, I just wanted to pick up on something Melissa said, which was um, the process Saudi is currently going through, which seems, as a, an external observer to be quite similar to the process that UAE went through 20 years ago, but on a vaster scale. I mean, to what extent is the Saudi transfer, transformation of their art scene uh, going to be beneficial to the UAE, perhaps even a threat to the UAE? Is there space for two vibrant, incredibly well-funded art scenes uh, mm -hmm. in the Gulf? Um, how is it going to change what happens both in the Gulf art scene, but also specifically in the UAE? Good question. Um, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Melissa, please. <laughs> Um, I mean, I think to answer that, you have to kind of take, you have to step back because before, before UAE kicked off, Qatar kicked off and you had Sheikh al Mayasa and the Althanis who were um, collecting a lot of um, contemporary work and also traditional Islamic work. And what Qatar did and then what the UAE did were, were kind of, as Abdi Sam said, they had their eyes on the international. So bringing the international to, um, to Qatar and to the UAE. 
at a very early stage in their development. What Saudi has done is they've looked to their own artists first, and they were kind of aided in that um, by the fact that Saudi is a much bigger country. There were more um, there were more organic art scenes that were already developed. I think because at that they developed a bit. Um, later in terms of the internet. So there were lots of ways for artists to be kind of making work um, and then connecting with each other, even if it wasn't seen publicly. Um, so, so kind of the, they're coming from different spaces in that, in that regard. And so Saudi can, um, can be more local in its outlook, which is a privilege I think that the UAE and Qatar didn't have. But, you know, I, th I would be lying if I said that people in Dubai aren't, aren't worried, you know, that you know, there, there is this kind of fear that there's only enough international oxygen for one mm -hmm. Gulf scene. And is it going to move to Saudi is a question that a lot of people are asking themselves. You know, I don't think so. I think I think now the scene in Dubai, the scene in Abu Dhabi, scene in Sharjah are so well developed that there are things happening on the ground, even if you don't have scores of people coming over for every March for Art Dubai. So, I, you know, but it's definitely a um, yeah, it's definitely a factor that's um, lots of people are thinking. But about. you see them coordinating like this year, there was like the Jitta Art Fair 2139, three days before Art Dubai. And then I don't know what, what the Sharjah schedule coordination was. Coordination or competition, I think. The but it was interesting because all these people flew in for Jitta and then they went on to Art Dubai. Yeah. And that was yeah. sort of a nice way to kind of bring everybody over to the region and kind yeah. of give them a taste of, you know, both scenes. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that, that's the other thing is the, what Saudi is doing is just, you know, they're doing Jeddah, they're doing Riyadh, they're doing al Ola, they're doing the Eastern province. Like the, it, that's, you know, hopefully, inshallah, I'll be here in 10 years talking about the transformation of the Saudi art scene <laughs> right. and we'll add another chapter. But, um, but yeah, it, that's another in, incredibly interesting space to watch. Got a question here? Thank you so much. Thank you both. Um, and I want to acknowledge also the courage of the artist on the video, um, the creativity, and also it's diplomatically astute to uh, negotiate the blessing of the sheikh. So congratulations on that. Um, uh, and it's very important for us in this year, especially to hear more about the diversity of the region and the artist, uh, which tends to be a political bubble. And speaking of um, arts, in the region, as you know, has inextricably been affected the tributary of, um, of politics. And now we finally have access to more of you, more artists. And should we be concerned that uh, what we see now going on with the uh, Ukrainian crisis, uh, the banning, the censorship of past and present uh, Russian artists, um, uh, could be a concern for that region, for your region as well? It represent a risk uh, for the for the artists to be sort of brought back into the affected by politics and ultimately if we not but have less less access to the art because of the trend of censorship when the conflict happened for example thank you melissa did you or if this time did you understand uh, go ahead you know i mean that's that's a great question it's a, the relationship between art and politics is you know I would say like a brother and sister one, like a love hate, you know, always kind of, um, it's always there, but it's not always welcome. <laughs> um, that's not how I feel about my brother, by the way. <laughs> I'm, always, I'm always happy to see him. Um, you know, the UAE has faced a lot of criticism internationally and the, the UK press, you know, loves to find things that happen in Dubai and say, you know, um, look at the lack of rights or what have you. I, I actually think that's getting better. I think people are understanding that, um, you know, the UAE is a diverse place where, um, you know, it's a diverse place that's intent on, on being progressive. So I think this question of politics is often more seen on the outside. If you're, you know, reading, reading about the UAE through news reports, then when you're in the UAE itself, I feel like um, the question of international politics is somehow put to one side. Um, you know, the, the Emirates Fine Art Society that we were talking about before, they had a slogan, um, what politics divides, art unites. Mm -hmm. so, so from the very beginning, there. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So there is a sense that the art is like kind of a space where you know, that discussion 
you know, doesn't doesn't really isn't doesn't really have a very large role. Thank you. Mimi, maybe last question. Uh, yes. Uh, Here, just wait for the microphone and maybe introduce okay. yourself. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Mimi Burke. Um, I'm so interesting, Eptisan, about your um, your video and how the police thought maybe it was a protest and or maybe the people didn't really know how to uh, to interpret that. And so interesting that I thought I would expand on um, the gentleman's question behind me that uh, how much is there protest in artists work in the UAE in the Gulf and the Middle East in general? How much of that is intentional? I'm um, just going to talk about myself. Everything I do is intentional. <laughs> yes, I, I happen to be this person. I cannot keep my mouth shut. If I see something I don't like, I will have to make something about it. Um, is it obvious? No. You have to read the statement. You have to maybe meet the artist. Like uh, an example, I did this project where the audience go in this installation video piece. They're in a narrow corridor. It's very dark. They can't see. And then they make a U-turn. They watch me with my vision, eye doctor answering, doing the regular thing that everybody does at an eye doctor, where the right is left and the left is right. So you as an audience, you leave thinking that was wrong. But then that was me saying, we basically read things in the news. The media is lying to us. Everybody sometimes is leading us toward this dark, narrow corridor when we don't know why we're doing this, but we have to. So I have been making art about politics, things that I, I think we all need to have our right to say things. And I always suggest to say it in a nice way, but we have to be truth to ourselves. So how much there is protest in the UAE in the Arab world, I don't know. <laughs> but I think every artist, from what I know, every artist, they speak up. Uh, it might not be a very loud voice. It might be a very shy, but we're trying to express. I myself moved to DC seven years ago now. And most of my, of my work has become about DC. We talk about politics. Mm. I'm not interested in the weather, um, <laughs> but I talk about politics. I talk about art and freedom and you know human rights and women rights and all of the stuff that we all care about as human beings, not just artists. Yeah, I hope I answer your question, yes, Mimi. <laughs> Thank you. Do you want to comment on, on political art in general in the Middle East or? Yeah. Well, you know, I want to be mindful of everyone's time and, and wrap this up. I want to conclude uh, with where we began, which is talking about these two amazing books. They are for sale. They're here in the back. Uh, one, each one sells for 75 to get it for 110. Uh, but if you're not going to buy, stop and, and just, you know, uh, flip through the pages to take a look at the incredible art uh, that they uh, contain. And they really are such an important, once again, archive and documentation of this period in history. Uh, Melissa referred to the fact that oftentimes people don't know what came before, but Admuf has done a wonderful job kind of collecting and documenting and archiving this really transformational art scene. And I know they'll be doing this every five years. So hopefully you'll all be back. And we'll be looking at, you know, Art of the Emirates 3 and Portrait of a Nation 3. So I hope you can be here to join us for that. In the meantime, we have this amazing uh, photography exhibition outside about contemporary Arab photography curated by Leila Hadi Jadalla and uh, in partnership with Tribe Magazine, whereas Suraya, um, it's an incredible platform for photography and video from the Arab world. So uh, please talk to her afterwards and maybe grab her or Lynn to give you um, a tour. Uh, we are open the third Thursday of every month um, as part of the DuPont Circle Art Walk Open House. So stop by with friends the third Thursday of every month and hopefully we'll see you at our upcoming events. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you.